Well, good morning and welcome to this webinar. What I'm going to be talking about today is looking at how you can build a workable support strategy for Java for next year. And the reason I'm going to do this is because there are quite a few changes that have happened in the last year, and there are more changes that are happening next year in terms of how Java is delivered, how Java is developed. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. My name is Simon Ritter. I work for Azul Systems as the Deputy CTO. I've been involved in Java for quite a long time now, uh, pretty much since JDK 1.0. So if we get started, I'd like to run a quick poll of the audience just to get a feel for where you're at in terms of the, the things that you're doing with Java. So I've asked a question, which is, do you have a strategy for how you're going to use Java in 2019? And I've given you five possible answers there. Um, the first is, yes, we're going to use commercial support. Second one is, yes, we will use free OpenJDK versions. Third one, yes, we will continue using Java without updates. And then two where I've said, no, we're still evaluating our options. And no, we actually have no plan at all. So if we just have a few seconds, and then if we close the poll and have a look at the results of that, then hopefully we will be able to see what the audience says. Hopefully, there we go. And then we should see the results appear. Yeah, there we go. Interesting. OK, that's um, OK. So you, there's some people who do have commercial support. Um, Interestingly, somebody is, or some people are going to continue without using updates, and most people, 75%, are still evaluating their options, um, which I suppose makes a lot of sense because you're listening to this webinar, and this webinar is all about what your options are going to be and what the changes are. So it's quite logical in that respect. Okay, so let's start talking about what's happening and what's changing then. So the first thing is, let's just remind ourselves of what we're used to in terms of Java, because with changes, what is it that we've been using in the past? OK, now, if we think about the way that we've used the JDK and the Java runtime, really, if you go back to JDK 5 and later, the pace of change has been I suppose it's polite to say quite sedate. Um, we haven't had a very rapid change of Java since JDK 5. And in fact, I did some research on this and I looked at the, the actual numbers. And the time between releases is anything between 26 months and 56 months. So somewhere between two years and four and a half years between major releases of the JDK. Now, clearly a number of things have affected that in terms of what technology has been added. Um, there were a, a number of things around the fact that Sun got acquired by Oracle. There were some issues around the JCP and so on, things like that. But ultimately, what we're used to is it being at least two to three years between major releases of Java. And in some ways, that's a very good thing because it means that we do have um, the ability to adapt to the changes in a you know a convenient way for us and we don't have to think about massive changes coming very very quickly the other thing that's been very good about the way that java has developed over that time is that we've had a lot of time to migrate between different releases and the way that's worked is that we've had a lot of overlap in terms of the updates to the previous release when a new release comes out. And again, I, I looked at this, and if you look up to JDK 9, there's been anything between just over a year and nearly three years of public updates that have overlapped between the previous version and the current version. Obviously, that has two advantages. One is it gives you time to think, OK, we're going to move to JDK 8, but we don't want to come off JDK 7 straight away. So it gives you time to do the testing, to figure out what changes you need to make in terms of moving to that new platform. But it also gives the platform itself the ability to settle down and to stabilize. Because with big new features being added, often there are some things which, you know, whilst it's very well tested, there are a few bugs that still need to be ironed out. And again, this overlap gives you a chance to say, OK, well, we'll give it a chance to just settle in and make sure it's absolutely stable. And then we'll move to that version of Java. So this is this is really what we've been used to in the past. 
And if you think about how Java could be described, realistically, you can use you know, three words that I put here. First is it's stable. And what I mean by that is that you have this ability to move between versions and not have to worry really about backwards compatibility. Yeah, there have been a couple of occasions where things have changed between releases that have affected backwards compatibility. If you look at all the way back in JDK 1.4, there was the introduction of assertions. So assert became a keyword. In JDK 5, we had enumeration. So enum became a reserved word, things like that. But ultimately, if you were going to migrate your code from those versions or to those versions, then you know the amount of work you'd need to do is, is actually really quite small. So we've been used to stability in terms of the platform and saying, OK, you know, moving between releases is not a huge effort in terms of adapting our code to work on that. Second thing we can say about Java is it's secure. And what I'm talking about there is not just the fact that it was initially designed to work in an environment where you were moving code around across a network and so it needed to work with security in mind right from the very beginning, but it's also the fact that we've had regular updates, which include any security patches that are required for that particular version of Java. You know, every three months there is an update to the JDK and that will include any patches that are required to address any potential security flaws, whether they're directly in terms of the, the Java platform or even things that might be affecting the Java platform but need changes within the JDK. So Meltdown and Spectre is a good example of that because those are things that affect the, the hardware level, but you still need some changes in the JVM and the JDK to address those changes. So we're used to security. We used to regular updates to keep the JDK as secure as possible. And the third thing is we're used to Java being free. You can go to the java.oracle.com website and you can download the Java for free and you can use it and everything works and you don't have to pay anybody for it. So this is this is what we're used to in terms of Java. Now, what happened a little bit over a year ago was the release of JDK 9. At the same time that JDK 9 came out, Oracle made some announcements about the way that it wanted to change both the way it was going to develop the Java platform, but also the way it was going to deliver both the, the core Java platform in terms of the major JDK releases and also the updates to those versions of the JDK. So what we'll do is we'll talk about what those changes are and how they're going to affect us in the, the next year or so. So the first thing is that we now have a new release model. So I said that from JDK 5, we were looking at between two and four and a half years for major releases. Now that's really changed in the last year. Oracle said that they want to have two major releases every single year. And we have already seen that happen. JDK 10 came out six months after JDK 9. So that was released in March this year. And JDK 11 came out a couple of months ago, six months after JDK 10. So we're already, already seeing this six month release cycle working. And I'm on the Java SE expert group for JDK 12. And I can tell you that that will come out in March of next year as well. So the six month release cycle is definitely working. Why did Oracle want to do that? Well, the idea was to really adapt the way that the Java platform was developed. So it used a more modern kind of approach. If you look at the way that people develop code now, we've moved away from the, the old fashioned waterfall model where we did all of our requirements capture, then we did all of our design, then we did all of our coding, then we did all of our testing. What we now see is much more of an agile approach, much more of an iterative kind of um, quick changes, continuous integration, continuous deployment type of approach where we can respond more quickly to changes in requirements. And this is a very good way of doing things because you know requirements do change over time. And by having this agile approach, you can get the features you need into your application much more quickly. So why not do the same thing in terms of the Java platform itself? And that's essentially the idea behind this. The goal that Oracle had had in the past was two years between releases, and they never actually hit that. The, even the best that they managed was, was two years and one month. So they, they weren't really quite on target for that. In order to do that, they've changed the way that they 
put features into a JDK. In the past, the JDK was really driven by the features, which meant that when JDK, let's take JDK 8 as an example, when they started planning JDK 8, they said, OK, what features do we want to put in this release? And that was going to be Lambda expressions, it was going to be streams, and there were some other things as well. Only when all those features were ready did they actually release the JDK. Similarly for JDK 9, modularity was the big feature that went into that release. And because of the complexity of that, there were several delays in terms of the JDK itself because modularity wasn't quite finished. If you want to have a six month release cycle, that's not going to work. So now it's been inverted in effect. What Oracle says is that, OK, we will release a JDK every six months and whatever features are ready at that point where we need to do a feature, feature freeze at that point, those are the features that will go in. So they're not planning specific features for a given release. They're saying these are the features we want to add when they're ready. They go into whichever release is next one to be um, made available. So, it, again, it's much more of an agile type of approach. So that's the release model. One of the other things that Oracle said was that with a new release model where you're having two releases every year, it just wasn't going to be practical to offer extended support for all releases. If you think about how quickly we're going to get a large number of releases um, that people will be using, then it just doesn't make sense in terms of the amount of engineering effort, the amount of people you would need to have long-term support for all of those. What Oracle announced was that they were going to switch to the similar kind of model that people like Ubuntu use. And the idea there is that rather than having every release as a long term support, only certain ones would be selected and they would be the ones which would have extended support made available for them. In terms of what Oracle said was that every three years, there would be a long term support release. So every sixth JDK release would be a long term support one. To get things started, um, Oracle said JDK 8 would be classified as a long-term support release and they would continue providing updates for that until, and they extended this a little bit, until January of next year. So this is where we're going to start seeing the fact that things are changing as of next year and this is why you need to be thinking about what to do. So in January next year, the last public update that can be used in a commercial environment is being released for JDK 8. There will be some further updates to that, but those are only going to be used for people who are non-commercial users. So a good example of that would be if you're sitting at home playing Minecraft on your PC, you're a non-commercial user and you can get updates to JDK 8 through the normal update installation process that runs on your PC or laptop, and that will continue until December of 2020. But if you're a commercial user, you're using JDK 8, January of next year is going to be the last public update that you will be able to deploy into production from Oracle. Oracle said that JDK 11 would be the next long-term support release. That came out two months ago, and that is a long-term support release from Oracle. For JDK 9 and JDK 10, they're classified as feature releases. Feature releases only have support until the next version of the JDK is released, which means essentially six months or two scheduled updates. Once the next release comes out, there are no more updates to these feature releases. JDK 9, JDK 10, there will be no more updates, and that includes in source code or in binary form um, once JDK 11 was released. So that's long-term support releases. The next thing that we need to look at is the fact that Oracle have decided to offer more than one JDK binary. In the past, as I said, if we wanted to download Java, typically we would go to java.oracle.com and we would select which version of the JDK we wanted. We would select the platform we wanted. And then there's a little tick box which says that we agree to the Oracle binary code license. Now, I'm not familiar with all of the details of that license, but I do know that it has what are called field of use restrictions. And this dates back to the days of Sun Microsystems. And essentially that says that you can use the JDK for free if you're running on a laptop, a desktop, or a server, 
but if you're trying to deploy this into a single purpose machine, such as a kiosk or a ticket machine or an embedded device, then you need to talk to Oracle about um, a commercial licensing contract for that use. But for desktops, for laptops, for servers, the use of the Oracle JDK is completely free. As of JDK 9 and 10, Oracle decided to have a second binary. So this is one that is built purely on the source code of the Open JDK. That's available through jdk.java.net and has a different license to the Oracle JDK. The license that it uses is the same as the Open JDK source code. So it's a GPL version two with class path exception. A class path exception is there to protect your application code from the viral nature of the GPL. So that if you ship a combined JDK and application, you don't have to provide the source code of your application code because of the GPL license on the JDK. There are no restrictions in terms of where you can use that. So if you want to deploy it on an embedded device, if you want to make a single purpose machine, then yes, you can do that without any problem. Now, in terms of the updates for these binaries, Oracle have said that they will only be providing updates for six months until the next release of the JDK comes out. So in this sense, there is no concept of a long-term support release for the open JDK binary from Oracle. And because of that, there's also no overlap of updates with the previous version, which is what we've seen in the past. To simplify things, because the Oracle are having two different binaries, they've decided to converge the functionality of those binaries. To illustrate what I mean by that, I've drawn this Venn diagram, which shows the, the different sets of functionality that are available within the JDK. The core part is the green circle here, which is the Java SE standard. And that defines a set of core libraries. It defines the functionality that's required for the JVM. It defines the Java language specification and so on. So in order to call something Java, you have to have that functionality in your JDK. OpenJDK is a superset of that functionality. Even though the OpenJDK source code is the reference implementation for the specification of Java SE, there's some things which are extra there. The most notable of those is the, the Nashorn um, scripting engine that um, allows you to run JavaScript from within the JDK. So that's part of the Open JDK, but it's not part of the Java SE standard. And then the Oracle JDK is a superset of the Open JDK where they provided some commercial features which were in addition to what was in the Open JDK. To simplify things from JDK 11 onwards, they've shrunk that down. So they've eliminated any differences between the Oracle JDK and what's in the Open JDK source code. So now we just have Java SE as the core part, and then both the Open JDK binary and the Oracle JDK binary have exactly the same functionality from JDK 11 and later. To do that, Oracle did two things. The first is that they open sourced some things which were commercial features and therefore closed source in earlier versions of the Oracle JDK. Most notable of these are things like flight recorder and mission control, which are tools you can use to monitor your JVM. You can look at the performance. You can see if you've got memory leaks and things like that. Application class data sharing was also a commercial feature which allows you to um, reduce the amount of time for startup by, in effect, caching the internal data structures that the JVM uses for class files. And then you can also share those amongst multiple JVMs if you're running in multiple instances of the same application on a physical machine. And there's a few other small things as well that they've added uh, as part of that. The other half of what they did was they removed a number of features which had been in the Oracle JDK previously, um, which were closed source, but they didn't want to make open source. This was a, an opportunity for them to remove some, certain things which uh, had been proving problematic in terms of maintenance. Um, they had had a number of security issues and so on. Most obvious of these are the browser plugin. So in essence, applets have gone away from JDK 11. 
Java Web Start, which is an alternative way of deploying applications. So it's sort of halfway between an applet and an application. That functionality has been removed from the JDK in version 11. And also Java FX, which was a replacement for AWT and Swing for writing graphical based applications. And because it was never part of the standard, that has been removed as well. So this brings us to the issue of compatibility, because with JDK 9 and onwards, compatibility is slightly different to what we're used to. And this is a quote from Oracle, where they say that clean applications that just depend on Java SE should just work. Now, clearly that's a, a little less reassuring than we would like. You know, we would like to see clean applications that just depend on Java SE will just work. But there are some reasons why things may not work on newer versions of the JDK. And these are things that you need to be aware of when you're migrate, migrating applications between versions. And the reason for this <clears throat> is that in JDK 9, Oracle decided to do some long overdue cleanup of the JDK. And what had happened over time was that more and more features had been added to the JDK. But to maintain this compatibility that we're used to, nothing had ever been removed. Because if you remove something, you're potentially breaking backwards compatibility. And it got to the point where Oracle said, OK, we need to have a bit of a cleanup. We need to remove some things, both to eliminate additional things that are not required anymore, but also to make the life of um, their engineers easier in terms of maintenance. So they started with some of the deprecated APIs. And we've had deprecation right from the beginning of JDK 1.1. And literally, I think about 450 API elements have been deprecated in the time since then, but not a single one have ever been removed. So in JDK 9, they removed some. So the first was they removed an entire class, which wasn't even part of the Java SE standard. It was in the Java app, uh, authentication and authorization service. And then from the Java SE standard, they removed a whole six methods. So a very small change, but that was more required really to um, aid in the modularization of the JDK class libraries and simplifying the way that they could split up the various libraries into different modules. They also removed a number of redundant features. So things like the JHAT tool disappeared, the Java Virtual Machine Tools interface, HProf Agent went away. There were various deprecated garbage collection options that were removed in JDK 9. Um, if you'd been using those, you would have got a warning message from JDK 8 or even JDK 7. And they also removed 187 of the minus XX command line flags. And so, as I say, these are things that you need to be aware of when you're moving to a new version of the, the JDK, because there will be some changes that might affect whether your application runs without change or whether you have to make some changes both to the code or the, the way that the JVM is actually started up. Now, this housekeeping, this cleanup is going to continue. So if we look at JDK 11, there were a few changes in JDK 10, but JDK 11 is quite significant because over 6,000 API elements were actually removed. And that's because they removed an entire, what's called aggregator module, java.se.ee. And now these are things which, again, are features which not many people, if any, use. So for example, Corba. Um, when I talk to developers, I find pretty much nobody is using Corba at the moment. There's the Beans activation framework. Again, you know, very few people using that. A couple of things that might catch you out. So there's the Java XML binding API, that's JAXB, and also the JAXWS web services APIs, which are for the older style SOAP based web services rather than the more modern RESTful approach. So there are still some people who are using that. Now, in terms of um, making code work, um, it's relatively straightforward. You just have to download the right modules um, from Maven Central or from the reference implementation, and you can get around this problem. But it is something that needs to be borne in mind. And this, again, is going to continue. So if you look at things like the CMS garbage collector, that has been deprecated. Nashorn, Pack 200, all been deprecated. And I would expect to see some other things being deprecated in the future as well, and then removed. So what Oracle have said is that they're not guaranteeing compatibility in the same way that they did in the past. 
And they've said quite explicitly that new versions of Java may include breaking changes, but they will give you warning. So they will make sure that anything that they are intending to remove will be deprecated first, whether it's an API, whether it's a language feature, whether it's part of the JVM, then it will be deprecated. And they will give us a minimum of one release warning, which is very generous of them because if they gave us less than one release warning, it would be no warning at all. The important thing about this is it does mean that there could be only six months between a feature being deprecated and that feature being removed from the JDK. Because with the new faster release cycle, you know, it could be JDK 13 deprecates a feature and then JDK 14 removes that feature six months later. Something to be aware of. So let's look at what Java is like now. So we've looked at what it was like in the past. What is it like now? Well, the first thing is that, as I said, Oracle are going to have a long-term support release every three years. And it's important to understand what that does mean and what it doesn't mean. So it means that there's a long-term support from Oracle every three years, but that doesn't mean three years of free updates, which is what we would have been used to in the past. Oracle have changed the license for JDK 11. So if you go to the Oracle, the java.oracle.com website now, and you go to download the JDK 11 binaries, you will find that there is a new end user license. It used to be the Oracle binary code license for Java SE. Now it's the Oracle technology network agreement license. And that is different. It's different because it says that you can still download JDK 11 or later for free, and you can use it for development, you can use it for testing, and you can use it for demonstrations. However, if you want to use the Oracle JDK in production, you cannot do that for free, regardless of whether it's a desktop, whether it's a server, whether it's embedded. In order to use it in production, you will need a Java SE subscription. So you will need to pay Oracle for support to use the Oracle JDK 11 or later in production. The free Oracle JDK binaries, so this is the alternative binary that they're providing through um, java.net, jdk.java.net. As I said, those ones only have updates for six months. So there is no concept of long-term support for the free Oracle Open JDK binaries. The other thing that's important to understand is that if you're using JDK 8, the license on that is not changing. So you can continue to use JDK 8 or 7 or 6 or 5 indefinitely for free. But you have to bear in mind that as of January next year, there will be no more public updates for JDK 8. So you won't be getting any more security patches. You won't be getting more bug fixes for JDK 8. But you can continue to use it if you want to without those updates for free. No problem. So coming back to what I said earlier about these three words that we can use to describe Java, stable, secure, and free. Those three words still apply to Java, the Java platform, in 2019. But what we have to do now is we have to choose two out of three. What do I mean by that? Well, if you say, OK, I want to have stable and free, then you're going to have to sacrifice security because you can say, OK, I'm going to carry on using JDK 8. That's stable because I know it works and I've tested my code on it and it's free because I don't have to pay for it. But I'm not going to be getting security patches anymore. So I'm potentially sacrificing the security of my application by having stable and free. If I want secure and free, we can do that, but we're going to sacrifice stability. The way we can do that is by using the Oracle Open JDK binary and changing JDK version every six months. That way, we're guaranteed to keep getting the security patches as they're made available. But we're going to sacrifice stability because, as I've explained, there may be breaking changes between versions. And even with new features being added, it could um, have certain issues in terms of how quickly those features become stable and how quickly any bugs get ironed out in that. And then if you want both stable and secure, then you're sacrificing free. Because in terms of Oracle's plan, what they're saying is you can have stable, JDK 8, JDK 11. You can have secure, which means you get continued updates to those. 
but you have to pay for it. So you need a Java SE support contract if you want to continue getting stable and secure. So let's just briefly talk about Azul's Zulu Java, because this is an alternative to using Oracle's Java. Zulu Java is our distribution of OpenJDK. What we do is we download the source code from the OpenJDK website. We take exactly the same source code that Oracle are using to build their JDK, and we run all of the same build scripts to generate our binaries. Once we've generated those binaries, we then run the TCK tests on that. And the TCK tests are part of the Java SE specification, and they're used to guarantee that whatever binary is being created matches the details of the specification. So if you've written some code in Java, you compiled it. If you're only using the, the Java SE standard, then your code will work on a version which has been tested with the TCK. So we make sure that it tests, passes all the TCK tests. In terms of versions, we actually go all the way back to JDK 6. And what we're doing is we're backporting fixes from newer versions. So at the moment, we've been backporting fixes from JDK 8 to JDK 6 and JDK 7. As things change next year and we move to JDK 12 and JDK 13, we'll be backporting fixes from those versions to 11, 8, 7, and 6. We're not going to have long-term support for 9 and 10 because those are feature releases. So we'll be using the same long-term support release idea as, as Oracle in terms of numbers. But we will also provide extended support for 6 and 7. We have wide platform support. So we cover the standard Intel 64-bit Windows, Mac, and Linux. We also have some customers who've asked us specifically for 32-bit versions because they're running older machines which have 32-bit operating systems on them, and they still want to have Java support on there. So we have 32-bit versions of the JDK for Windows and Linux. And then we also have versions that can be used uh, for embedded systems, so ARM32, PowerPC, and ARM64, which could either be an embedded system or it could be what we're seeing now, um, certain servers being developed using that architecture. So a wide range of support available for different platforms and different versions of the JDK. What we do in terms of extending support is make sure that what you're getting is exactly what you need. So we will backport, as I said, any bug fixes and security patches from the supported OpenJDK release. So whether that's 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on. And we will continue doing that for a long time. And depending on which version of, of Java you want supported, um, the, the time that we would continue doing that um, will vary. So right now, we are saying that for Zulu 8, which is JDK 8, this will be supported until March 2026. So that's another seven years and a bit of updates for that. If people will want to move or want to carry on using JDK 8 beyond that, most likely, if we have a number of customers who want to do that, we will continue to do that um, for longer. Uh, we're very flexible about that kind of thing. Our typical approach is that for long-term support releases, we will provide nine years of active support, meaning we will backport fixes for nine years, and then we will have another two years of passive support beyond that. And passive support is effectively saying we won't be issuing patches and, and bug fixes as updates for those versions, but if you're continuing to use it and you have a problem, you can still phone us up and say, this bit doesn't work. We will then create a fix and generate a binary for you with that fix in it. Another thing that we have decided to do is to enable you to use some of the versions of Java which fall between the long-term support releases. And we're calling these medium-term support releases. So two of the versions between the long-term support releases, so let's take between 11 and 17, 13 and 15 are going to have extended support so that you can, you can use those beyond the six months that you get the updates from Oracle. The idea here is that if there's a feature in 13 or 15 that you really want to use, then you can deploy that into production, you can continue getting updates, and we will continue to do that until 18 months after the next long-term support release comes out, so that you've got 18 months to migrate your application from, let's say, 13 to 17. 
We offer complete support for our Zulu JDK. So this is not just about backporting the fixes that Oracle make available. We do provide a complete support package. So in terms of customer interaction, we can do 24 by 7 by 365, or we can do 8 by 5. We can do telephone and email contact. And if you do have a problem with the JDK, you can report it through one of these channels, and we will work with you to get a resolution to that problem. We have a, a follow the sun engineering team, so we can actually work on a problem literally 24 hours a day. Um, we have very highly experienced engineers. Many of them are ex sun engineers, ex Oracle engineers who've worked on the Java team. They know what goes on in terms of the JDK and the JVM because they actually help develop certain parts of it. And as I said, we go beyond just backporting the fixes that Oracle make available. We can do root cause and create fixes for problems if you find them and they're not being addressed by um, the OpenJDK team. So we can generate custom JDK binaries for fixes and we will, to the best of our ability, upstream those fixes into OpenJDK where we can. Just to kind of put that into a picture in terms of um, what we're doing. So as I said, we have the long-term support releases which match with the Oracle ones. So these are the, the blue ones here. So we can see 11 is a long-term support release. Eight is a long-term support release. Um, seven for us is a long-term support release as well. And then in terms of the medium-term support releases, um, we're actually saying that uh, 13 and 15 will be long medium-term support releases. Um, if you wanted to use nine, we could we could do that as medium term support release, but I, I think nobody's really going to switch to nine because 11 is already out. And so that would make sense. So 13 or 15 um, will have continued support until 18 months after 17 comes out so that you've got time to migrate to that version. Just to summarize then um, what I've kind of said, um, Java is changing and it really is changing next year in a way that is going to have to be addressed with people who are using Java in production. So the fast release cadence every six months without necessarily having backwards compatibility between releases, long-term support release every three years, but no free long-term support release, six months of updates only, no overlap of updates that we used to, and most importantly, Azul can help. So we can provide extended support on more releases, uh, old releases as well. We can help you ease the migration path for applications so that you don't have to make a switch when somebody tells you to, you can plan for it and you can work with the development teams to get your code migrated in the best possible way. And we will help you with testing and supporting and not just porting of those fixes. So with that, um, I'm gonna say thank you very much. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna see whether we have any questions. And we'll see. One thing I will say is that we will be sending everybody a copy of the slides and there will be a recording of this presentation made available as well. So if you want to see the slides, then uh, we will send you a PDF copy of that. Um, OK, somebody about audio. OK, that's fine. OK, are we able to use Zulu 8 with IntelliJ ID? Um, IDE. Um, yes, it should work without any problem. I mean, it is just uh, a drop in replacement of the JDK. So all you would need to do is configure your IntelliJ um, IDE to point at the, the right version of the, the JDK and it will work without any problem. Um, I've actually done that myself, so I know that would work. Um, is Zulu a fresh implementation of Java reference owned by Azul or is it built upon OpenJDK's implementation by Oracle? Um, okay, well, I need to be quite precise about how I answer this. At the moment, what we are doing is we are simply taking the, for, for JDK 8, we are simply taking the source code from Oracle and compiling it because they are still updating JDK 8 with um, bug fixes and, and patches. For JDK 7, JDK 6, we are actually backporting those fixes and creating a, um, a, a source code tree with changes and then building that to generate the binaries. So for JDK 6, because we are actually the project lead on OpenJDK 6, we're also able to upstream those fixes into the OpenJDK project. For JDK 7, Red Hat are the project lead, so we work with them in terms of ensuring that, uh, because they do backporting as well, um, so we, we work with them in terms of making sure that the fixes get upstreamed into the relevant JDK project. As we move forward, 
obviously when JDK 8 ends in terms of public updates, Oracle will resign the project leadership and somebody will take over. Most likely that will be Red Hat. Uh, same for JDK 8, most likely uh, Red Hat will take over, uh, sorry, JDK 11, most likely or um, Red Hat will take over the um, running of that project and then we'll work with them in terms of upstreaming fixes. So um, essentially it is exactly the same JDK. It's just that where the fixes come from, part of the time we do the backporting, part of the time other people will do backporting, uh, but that's essentially it. Um, so I don't see any other questions here. So uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for listening.